Good evening, everyone. We're glad you could join us. My name is Brian Harper, and I'm the Director of Communications at DAN. If you don't mind, please post in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. As with all of our webinars, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of this one, so please post any questions you have in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on it, so feel free to post them as they come to you. Note that if you're watching this on the events page of dan.org, you won't be able to post questions, so in that case, Look at the bottom of the left corner of your video player, click the YouTube logo, and you can post questions in the chat on Dan's YouTube channel. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. Francois Berman is the Director of Risk Mitigation at Dan. He is responsible for all Dan's safety and accident prevention initiatives, as well as the Recompression Chamber Network. He has traveled around the world to conduct safety assessments at facilities used to treat injured divers and has written two books, The Risk Assessment Guide for Dive Operators and Professionals and The Risk Assessment Guide for Recompression Facilities. Dr. Matias Nichetto is the Director of Medical Services at DAN, where he has worked since 2006. He is co-director of the DAN UHMS Continuing Medical Education Program and a faculty member of several national and international diving medicine courses and programs. He became a dive instructor during medical school which led him to complete a three-year clinical and research fellowship in hyperbaric and diving medicine to combine the two passions. Tonight, they will be speaking about recompression chambers, what they are and how they are used. Over to you, Francois. Thank, Thank you, Brian. Brian. So, so this evening, we're gonna be discussing recompression chambers and the intention is to really highlight the importance of these chambers and how they work, because most of our divers know that if you get, if you get bent, you're going to be sent to a recompression chamber. And our dive operators and professionals know that they, that's ultimately the place of treatment that we have for an injured diver, so they need to know where they are. And what we would like to do this evening is to explain to you what happens in a chamber, what it looks like, without getting too technical and too medically intense in the presentation. So I'm going to give you a, a brief summary from the technical aspect um, as to what a chamber is, what to expect, and really what you can expect to see inside the chamber when a diver is taken in for treatment. So I'd like to kind of explain a few of the terms that you will hear people talk about because they get a bit confusing. And we often get the question when we hear, well, there's a decompression chamber available, can they then treat injured divers? So we have a range of names of these chambers, starting with what we call the traditional deck decompression chamber, typically used by commercial divers to complete their decompression in a chamber rather than hanging in the water after a, last, after a long dive, you know, getting cold and uncomfortable and so on. So they will get back on board, get into the decompression chamber and complete their decompression obligation in relative comfort. Then we have the recompression chamber, which is what we use to treat injured divers. So we essentially take the diver back down to depth, but obviously this time in air, and then we allow the effect of oxygen to heal them, to get rid of the bubbles, and to do some healing on their system. And that's what we're going to focus on this evening. Then you'll hear about a clinical hyperbaric oxygen chamber that's typically used to treat a range of medical conditions. Matthias will touch a little bit on that. And then we get a commercial dive, diving chamber, and I'm sure you're getting kind of confused with the terminology at this stage. A commercial diving chamber is a chamber used in commercial diving operations. It can be a deck decompression chamber, it can be a saturation chamber, it can be a workup chamber. And then we get what's called an evacuation chamber, which is in essence a, a medical stretcher, hyperbaric stretcher, which is, which is used to take an injured diver from the dive site typically going to be commercial divers and transporting them under pressure to the nearest or the high ne next level of care in terms of a, of a chamber. Having said all of that, these are all pressure vessels for human occupancy and in all of them we're going to be putting the diver under pressure to get a healing effect and whether it's a deck decompression chamber or a commercial diving chamber, we can achieve recompression in all of these. Then the one that kind of sticks out a little bit is called the monoplace chamber, typically used in wound healing and a range of other medical conditions. And yes, we can use a monoplace chamber to treat an injured diver. Not the most comfortable because you're essentially alone inside the chamber. Treatments can be up to four, hour, four and a half hours, if not longer. So that gets a bit challenging because you can't sit up and any of your other body functions have to be done within the confines of a small tube. But ultimately, all of these 
pressure vessels for human occupancy are used to put a diver back under pressure when it comes to an injured scuba diver and then effect, begin that healing process to get rid of the bubbles and to do some healing in the process to get them really back to where they should be. Then you'll hear us talk about locks and what is a lock and how does this fit into a chamber. Again, it tends to get a bit confusing. So we'll have a single lock or single compartment chamber, which you can see a pretty illustrative picture there. We often have divers saying, we can get hold of one of these portable, flexible chambers. Can we do recompression in them? And the answer to the question is, you could in theory, but we don't. We would prefer to use this as a stretcher to get the, the diver to the next level of care because we need a bit more space and a bit more vis visibility of the diver to be able to treat them safely. The monoplace chamber is essentially the same thing, a one-person chamber, but that's traditionally used in, um, under oxygen and used for healing purposes. Again, we can treat divers in that. Then we get to what we would expect in a recompression chamber, what we call a multi-place chamber, a chamber that can handle several people, you know, anywhere from two to, to 16 people in the chamber, depending on the size. So we've got one compartment or we've got two or more compartments and we have a what we call a treatment compartment or the main lock as commercial divers would call it. And this is where the injured diver will sit to get their treatment or they'll lie on the stretcher depending on how it's laid out. And what you might find in some of these more remote areas is they don't have chairs, they don't have stretchers, they have a mattress on the floor because the chamber is relatively small. Once again, it's just a level of comfort, but all of them are capable of giving effective treatments. Then we get what's called the entry lock, and this is used to transfer somebody under pressure into or out of the chamber. Just think of it this way. The diver's been treated, they have some medical emergency, we need to get the doctor into the chamber, we don't want to bring the chamber back to the surface, so we lock the doctor in, put them in the entry lock, close the door, put it under pressure, and when the doctor's at the same pressure as the diver, they can get in there and do whatever is necessary. And then the last of these terms is called the medical or the service lock. And this is essentially a small transfer lock where we can put medications, food, blankets, and various other things needed by the, by the occupants on the inside. And it allows us to do that transfer under pressure. So getting something in without having to release the pressure in the chamber. Here's a good picture of a typical clinical monoplace chamber. They normally run between 45 minutes and one and a half hours. It's a typical treatment that they would be used for. But we have very effectively treated really injured uh, scuba divers in these. They're not the chamber of choice, but you know, whatever needs be when you're stuck somewhere, if there's a monoplace chamber, it's just as effective at, um, at treating someone. This is what you'd hope to see. This is a very nicely fitted out, um, what we call a dual lock chamber, multi-place chamber. Comfortable, nice seats on the inside, lots of instruments on the inside, so there's you know, entertainment systems and so on. And if you look at the end, you'll start to see some of the things that confuse people, the complexity in terms of the piping. But I'll come to that in a slide or two and you know, explain to you that it's really not that complicated once you understand what the components are and how they work. So on the left, typical twin lock um, chamber, which we would usually see on a diving site as a deck decompression chamber. But these days we've gone from twin locks to triple locks and even to quad lock, four lock chambers used in hospitals to treat injured people. Um, some of them are almost a full on operating theater, but if you're a diver in some countries, you know, that's the kind of chamber you'll be treated in and you'll be really spoiled because some of your colleagues that are treated in some of these islands will have a really small chamber that they need to be inside for, for over four hours of treatment time. Okay, so without getting too complicated, let me try and explain to you how these things work in terms of what the diver or the dive professional or whoever's taking the diver to the chamber can expect to see and how it actually functions. So to put the diver under pressure, we need to increase the pressure inside the chamber. And we do that using air or oxygen or some form of a gas mixture. Usually for an injured diver, we'll be given them what Dr. Nocetta will be referring to later as a table six, and we take them down to about 60 feet of seawater. So that's the traditional, typical depth that you could expect, and we would dive the, the, the diver using air inside the chamber. We can take them deeper, we can go down to 100 feet of seawater, and then we'd typically be using a mixed gas, either in the chamber or giving the mixed gas to the patient. 
And then we do have chambers that will be compressed on pure oxygen, the typical monoplace chamber. We have to be careful, obviously, with the fire hazard and using oxygen. But any of these three types of gases can be used to get that diver back under pressure. So once we're under pressure, it does get warm, especially in smaller chambers. There might be a buildup of carbon dioxide. It gets smelly, it gets sweaty, and you want to get rid of some of that um, unpleasantness inside the chamber. So we will do what we call vent the chamber. We'll add a bit of gas and we'll remove a bit of gas, taking great care to keep the pressure stable. So it requires a little bit of skill. And we'll scrub out the atmosphere to get rid of the smell and get some fresh, cooler air into the chamber. And then once the treatment's done, um, and even during the treatment, if we need to release the pressure, we will surface the chamber. Same as coming to the surface when you're diving. We will release, exhaust the gas, and obviously in a very controlled way, bring the chamber back up to the surface. Very important that we monitor the depth very, very carefully. Because of the healing effect, we require specific pressures to give what we call a dose of oxygen. And it really depends on the time and the pressure. So we want to have good control over the depth at any one particular time. OK, so that's really how it works. And that's, it's no more complicated than that, although you know, you'll see computer control chambers where a lot of this thinking is done, done for us. Now, we're providing a medication to the patient. So our medication is, in most cases, going to be pure oxygen. But remember that the oxygen you're breathing in the chamber is a medication, whereas the oxygen you're using for your nitrox mix or your deco mix is going to be a breathing gas, not a medical gas. And one can go into the, to the differences, but ultimately oxygen is oxygen, and it's the same, the same compound, the same gas, the same molecule. So we need to get that gas to the patient. And because we're treating around about 60 feet of seawater, those of you that remember your training, we're getting very close to the levels of toxicity. So we are very cautious that we don't uh, um, you know, have one of our patients seizing. So the tender on the inside will be breathing air so that they are not going to seize. And the patient will be breathing 100% oxygen, either using a hood that you can see on your right hand side or some form of a plastic mask, which is more comfortable. But most of us that have been diving for, you know, over the years, we kind of old school, we used to seeing the typical aviator mask inside the chamber where we breathe in through a demand valve, same as diving on a scuba apparatus, and we exhaust, we dump the gas outside the chamber. And we don't want to keep the oxygen in the chamber. We want to try to keep the level of oxygen as low as possible to mitigate the fire hazard. And then we obviously give air brakes to the patient to break that cycle of oxygen. And again, I'll leave that to my colleague here to explain. But we need to be able to get the patient to breathe air. So either we have to feed it to them in the mask, or they simply take the mask off and breathe the chamber air. OK, so, so far, so good. We have the chamber pressure. We're giving the medication. A couple of things we need to take care of during the treatment. The first is the depth. And so we don't you know, have one of these relatively inexpensive, difficult to read depth gauges we use when we're diving. These are very accurate, calibrated gauges that give us very fine increments so that we can get the, the diver to the right pressure, keep them there, and then gradually bring the pressure down at a very controlled rate. So they are nice and big, easy to read, but very high-tech gauges. Clearly, we need to be able to talk to the folks on the inside, especially if there's a complication, the doctor on the outside will need to talk to the, to the attender on the inside, the attendant, and explain you know, what they need to do. Or they just have a chat and find out that everybody's comfortable. You know, it's getting warm in here. Can you ventilate the air a little bit? So we have this very clear two-way communication. I'll come back to this in a moment. But yes, we are giving our patients 100% oxygen. But on the other hand, we don't want oxygen in the chamber, in an air filled chamber, because it's a fire issue for us. So we try to keep the oxygen level in the chamber at under 23.5%. And it actually, in a small chamber, can rise very quickly if the mask is not located properly on the patient's face and they're leaking oxygen from the mask into the chamber. So we monitor that very carefully, very important piece of equipment. You may not often see a carbon uh, dioxide monitor. It is important. Those of you that are a rebreather divers know all about the effect of elevated levels of carbon dioxide. But we'll typically find it on a smaller of the recompression chambers where the tender breathing out is going to gradually build up the carbon dioxide levels. And we want to flush out the gas to, to keep those down. The, 
the, the, the patient, the diver that's being treated, clearly is breathing oxygen and dumping his gas outside the chamber or her gas, and they won't be contributing to the carbon dioxide levels. And then lastly, comfort, creature comfort. We try to keep our chambers round about in the 70 degree um, Fahrenheit or round about 20 odd degrees Celsius, which is comfortable. Um, and we try to keep the humidity down, not too dry that we then generate static electricity, not too moist that we end up perspiring excessively, but it's going to be humid inside there. And we want to try to manage that as best we can, again, flushing out the air inside the chamber, you know, in these kind of periodic cycles that we would use. Then lastly, we need to protect the diver and obviously the tender and everybody else around the chamber for that matter too. So our primary concern during a treatment is going to be having these elevated levels of oxygen. And that's something that the, the um, operator on the outside will be continuously focusing on, reading the oxygen levels and making sure that it never gets above this magic level of 23.5%. And this evening, we won't talk about where those levels come from, but what we can tell you is that under pressure, anything above 23.5% oxygen, the flame speed and heat of ignition become really very, very difficult to control. So if we're going to have a fire, we want to keep the O2 level as low as possible. But clearly, we don't want to get rid of the oxygen because people don't survive very well with, uh, with no oxygen. So fires are caused by three primary elements, and it's important not so much to understand the chemistry of, of what a fire is, but we need three things to be present. We need oxygen to support the combustion, we need something that can burn, and we need something that can cause the, the fuel to turn into a vapour and put enough energy in there to get ignition. And, and why do I bring this up now? It's because we're going to try really hard to remove at least one of those elements. And if we remove one of those elements, it's physically impossible to have a fire inside a chamber. We can't get rid of the oxygen, but we can keep the level as low as possible. We can't get rid of fuels because anything can burn, but we will try to keep readily burnable fuels out, so anything that can be you know, volatile at fairly low temperature. And we'll try to keep the heat sources out. So electronic equipment, and I'll give you a couple of other items that we try to keep out of the chamber. And between those three things, if you remove any one of those elements of the triangle, we're not going to end up with a fire. But history has taught us that we do have fires. So we need to be prepared for them. And we have what we call a, a hyperbaric fire extinguisher, which really is something designed to handle the external pressure. So you take a regular fire extinguisher, put it inside the chamber, and activate it. And if the pressure in the chamber is higher than the pressure in the cylinder, the gas is going to go into the extinguisher, and no liquid is going to come out. Typically, we use a water extinguisher, or we'd have uh, what they call a foam-filled, a liquid foam-filled product, which is very effective at blanketing the fire. But what we like to see in the most um, acceptable, the safest of all the variations, is what you call a deluge system. And here you can see some divers having great fun. They're somewhat knocked, and they've activated the fire deluge system just to give them that experience of being wetted. And they, they are highly effective at cooling things down and thereby containing the fire. However, the only way to actually put out a fire if there's elevated oxygen is to shut off the oxygen. If we are 100% oxygen, you can fill that chamber with water and you will not put the fire out. So the actual fire extinguisher is the shut off valve to the oxygen. Four and a half hours in the chamber can be pretty boring. So you will find chambers have at least a speaker to play music or you can watch a movie through the portal. Sometimes they'll shine the, um, the movie from the projector through the portal onto a sheet. And again, those of us that have been around for a while are used to seeing a white sheet put up on the side of the chamber. But these days, with low power LED TV screens, you'll find chambers that have a TV screen for every patient, you know, so they can watch their own movies on demand and you know, while away those long hours of, of treatment. We do allow books and magazines in the chamber, but limiting the quantity and making sure that it's nice, thick material like your National Geographic, and certainly not newspaper, which is much, much easier to ignite. And then the last couple of words from my side on the safety. So we have three elements of concern in a hyperbaric chamber. Fire, which I've mentioned already, and we've history sh shown us that fires do happen in chambers. We have the effect of pressure, so when we increase the pressure inside the chamber, some of the mechanical items are going to suffer. If they can't vent properly, as we know, 
You have to exhale when coming to the surface, exactly the same in a chamber. So people take in their water bottles, they forget to loosen the cap, the water bottle is half full. As we take the chamber down in pressure, the water bottle collapses. If they tighten it after having emptied the liquid in the chamber, they put the cap back on and we bring the chamber back to the surface, the water bottle will burst. So Boyle's law applies to anything inside a, a chamber and we just need to be aware of it. It's really no rocket science in preventing that and your chamber operators are going to be well aware of that. And then believe it or not, decompression is one of the, the safety elements in a chamber. It's not this time the patient, because they're breathing oxygen, but the tender, the person assisting the patient, is breathing air, because we don't want them to have a toxicity seizure and become um, you know, incapacitated. So if that tender is in there too long, and if you think of four hours, four and a half hours breathing air, that's, you know, that's time to change that tender out. And we do bend tenders. That's just something that happens not very often, but that's one of the safety elements that we try to manage through exchanging tenders, getting them to breathe oxygen, and so on. So of, to avoid all of this, we try to get the folks that are getting the chamber out of their street clothes, because we have no idea what might be in their pockets and what the materials might be. So we get them to take a shower to get rid of any oil or any contamination on them. Put on what we call scrubs, pure cotton garments or some cotton blend that is relatively safe in terms of fire. We get rid of their mobile phones and their iPods and their tablets. We clearly don't want those in a chamber. And if there's any, a, ever a stark reminder, we've seen these pictures of lithium-ion batteries in cell phones and laptops and iPads catching on fire. Very, very infrequent. But the last thing we want to do is have one of these issues inside the chamber. And one of the major causes of chamber fires, and this is not typically in the medical um, hyperbaric environment, are people taking cigarette lighters and pocket warmers, these things that you use to keep, your, the hunters use to keep themselves warm. Older folks get cold inside the chamber, they take out this chemical or this um, gas-powered pocket warmer, and we know that's caused fires in the chambers. But ultimately, we want to make sure that people are properly educated before they go in, and that way we'll avoid having any of the incidents. So we try to keep silly people out. Okay, so I've given you a kind of a rundown as to what the systems are all about, and just really to share some experiences with you. As Brian said, I've traveled around the globe um, doing safety assessments on chambers, primarily for Dan, and I've seen a pretty broad range of chambers out there. Some of them are pretty cool. Some of them are pretty small, some of them are really, really fancy. But here you can see some of the traditional Caribbean facilities that you know, most of us are used to seeing in Cayman. Sometimes they're hand-me-downs from the Dutch Navy or from the British Sub Aqua Club, but usually they're donated by somebody um, and fortunately find their way into a medical facility and kept operational. For those of you that like traveling to the Red Sea, there are a range of chambers over there. It's interesting that we have actually a large number of chamber treatments given, and some of you that have traveled might recognize the chamber on the top on the left. It probably holds the record for having treated the largest number of injured scuba divers. It's in Sharm el Sheikh, in, you know, in the Red Sea in Egypt. And then throughout the rest of the Red Sea area, we have really modern chambers, we have monoplace chambers, and then we have really old um, commercial diving chambers that have been put together to serve as a recompression facility. And then, Last one I like to raise is an interesting model f um, of chambers. In the Maldives, great diving in the Maldives, very upmarket resorts. They're separated you know, by a fair amount of distance in some cases, so to get a diver to the nearest chamber might take several hours. So some of these upmarket resorts will actually install their own chamber. They might treat five divers a year, um, but it's there so that their guests can see you know, they're taken care of, there is a chamber there and they can be treated. And we have somewhere between five and seven chambers um, scattered through the Maldives. But having said all of this about chambers, remember that our primary focus is to see what is down underwater, to enjoy it. You'll hear about people having treatments. What I'd like to say to you is that we can take good care of them no matter where we're diving, but it's not something that should worry the average diver as long as you follow the rules and do what you're taught to do. So that's what you can expect on a technical level to see. And what we thought to introduce to you is what happens inside the chamber. How do we use these chambers to treat an injured dive? And I'm going to have our colleague, Dr. Nocetto, explain to you what happens, why we use them, how we use them, and what takes place inside the chamber. So, Matthias. Thanks, Francois. 
Okay, so let me try to walk you through the basics of why we, we put someone in the chamber. What happens while we're there? So a brief medical summary. So we need to remember that diagnosis comes before treatment. And I want to emphasize that a chamber may not always be the solution to what is happening to a diver. So let's figure out this scenario. So we have a diver. He has done three, nine dives in three days, and all these dives were exceeding 80 feet of water, all on air. So the last day of diving, he did the first dive down to 140 feet for 55 minutes, and then the second to 120 for again 55, and the third to 90 feet for 50 minutes. So it's a pretty significant dive history and a pretty significant day of diving, the last day. And he starts with shoulder pain. So Everybody would say, well, this guy is clearly bent, so he needs a chamber. But then if I show you that, well, this guy has a left shoulder pain, and he is a 62-year-old male, he's a sedentary male, and the pain radiates to his arm, and he also feels an oppressive weight on his chest, and he's six feet, pretty big man, and he's hypertensive, and he's a smoker. So all of a sudden we say, well, maybe this is not necessarily decompression sickness, this could be cardiac. So then if that's the case, should I take him to the closest chamber or should I take him to the closest hospital? And the reason is, well, you know, bubbles, we're all concerned about bubbles. We have a fascination to some degree with bubbles, but bubbles will rarely kill someone. The heart will eventually do so. So we need to rule things out first. So we always say that decompression sickness is a clinical diagnosis and it's an exclusion diagnosis. Everything else needs to be ruled out first. So there are no diagnostic tests to confirm decompression sickness. Uh, most cases of DCI are mild or very moderate. And delaying treatment for a few hours, looking for some other explanation for the symptoms has never been associated with worse outcomes. So we need to rule out things first. So if you have a diver that has symptoms and you're 50 miles away from a chamber or 100 miles away from a hospital, the answer will always be take them to the hospital first. If the patient needs something that is not a chamber, that is life-threatening, like a heart attack, well, the hospital is the place. If everything else has been ruled out and we can't explain those symptoms by any other means like decompression sickness, it was time well spent and then we can take him to the chamber to receive treatment. And sometimes in some locations, the hospital has a chamber too, okay? So that's the best scenario. And that is why we, or what we look for. Every time we hear of a new chamber somewhere, we want to know more about what this chamber can do, about what the staff can do with the chamber, and where the chamber is placed. Then we have a fairly good idea of what the chamber can do, what the staff, and, well, make sure that we can give better referrals to every single case. So, it is important to remember that a chamber is just another medical tool and is only as good as the team running them. So what you see here, this is a medical tool to administer a drug. This is also a medical tool to administer a drug. And so is this, right? So you would not run, if you, if you need medication, you would not run to your friend's house just because he has an IV pump. Well, the same thing happens to a chamber. A chamber and its placement and the team behind it makes the whole difference. So remember this, everybody knows and everybody's familiar with what, it, what this is, right? So we can make soda at home by just putting water and exposing that water to a high pressure gas. The gas dissolves in the liquid and we have soda. So if you think about it, the human being is about 70% water. So we're not that different than that bottle of water. And we do have a canister full of gas under pressure to dissolve in our tissues. So essentially, we're not that different than that soda. So if we accept that following a dive, we are the soda man, right? So we know that there's a strong association between bubbles and DCI. So how do we get rid of those bubbles to prevent us from having DCI? So one thing we can do is just to wait time. Right? That's what we do every time we surface from a dive is we wait your surface interval 
to make sure that you're off gassing and making sure that you're not excessively reloading you with, with, uh, with nitrogen on the second dive. So time is good when you want to off gas, but when someone has to go person sickness, leaving them uh, on their own is not the best approach. So the other thing we can do is we can cause mechanical agitation. This is fairly effective in getting rid of a gas in a given solution, but when we have someone suffering from decompression sickness, the last thing you want to do is to make them do excessive uh, physical activity. So that is why we don't recommend excessive physical activity following a dive. You're the Coca-Cola man. You're never going to be shaking that soda before opening it. The other thing we can do to get rid of those bubbles is to alter the environmental characteristics, the features, what is going on with that liquid. So there are a number of things we can do. One is we can heat up the solution. Again, very effective with the soda. The last thing you will want to do with a diver is to expose them to heat, to go into a hot shower, to go into a, into a hot tub. It's, again, it's great to off gas, but it can increase the risk of decompression sickness. So not a good solution for someone that has symptoms. Now, we can also add solutes. Well, we know that sometimes that can cause some unpredictable uh, um, uh, uh, phenomena. so not a good thing to, to add to a diver. I'm not saying that you should not take Mentos following a dive, I'm just being silly with the example. Now, we can add solvents. Okay, that makes sense. If I want to dilute that kind of soda, if I add water, I'm diluting it, I'm having less gas content. That is why we recommend people to drink fluids following a dive. You're essentially diluting them. That is why part of the treatment for the compression sickness is hydration. So we're on the right track here. Now we can also keep that soda can under pressure. That is why we put them in the chamber. We want to prevent that, temp that pressure drop to be causing more bubbles. And the other thing we can do is to physically force the inert gas out. And we can achieve that with oxygen. So what we have here are the three pillars to treat someone with the bends. We have hydration, we have pressure, and we have oxygen. So let's go back to pressure. Everybody understands that when we have a bubble, we want to use pressure, boilers physics, to squeeze that bubble. So we have a bubble that eventually blocks a, a given a blood vessel, and everything behind that bubble is, of course, going to suffer hypoxia. So we think, well, if I add pressure and I can shrink that bubble, eventually the bubble will embolize or block more distantly and the compromised tissue is far less. So everybody can wrap their mind around that. That makes sense. Okay. So we should add pressure. We should squeeze that bubble. But how far should we squeeze it? Should we continue to go on forever until that bubble disappears? Well, it's not that easy. And when you start squeezing someone, you're running into another, another set of problems. So apparently the, the sweet spot is around three atmospheres. If you think on the right where you have the size of the bubble, when you compress someone to three atmospheres or around three atmospheres, around 60 feet, you're reducing the size of the bubble to 33%. If I add just one more atmosphere, it's only what? Seven, eight percent more uh, decrease in, 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 in size. So it's not that significant. And when I start breathing oxygen past three atmospheres absolute, I'm running into a whole set of problems. So that is the sweet spot. Sorry. The deeper I go, the more I go into troubles and it doesn't, it's not worth it, the risk. So what you see here is the standard treatment for decompression sickness, at least in this part of the world, what we call the US Navy Treatment Table 6. So what happens here? What you see in yellow are the times where the diver is going to be breathing air, and what you see in green are the times where the diver is going to be breathing oxygen. So look at this as very similar to a dive profile, right? Depth and time. So what happens is initially we want that diver to be down at depth in a short time. Usually about three minutes you reach 60 feet or 1.8 atmospheric atmospheres in the chamber or 2.8 absolute. So during that time, the diver is going to be breathing air. And once he reaches pressure, he's going to be breathing oxygen from the mask that Francois was showing you before. So 10 minutes into the treatment, this is a key part. Sometimes divers with mild or moderate symptoms, they show a fantastic improvement and the symptoms actually go away within 10 minutes. That's eventually when the doctor may decide to change the treatment table and do a shorter one. 
quite often we just go ahead and continue with the six. After 20 minutes, the diver will be breathing air, right? He does this air break. And we do these air breaks to prevent oxygen toxicity. Every time you stop breathing oxygen at that depth and you start breathing air, your body catches up and recuperates from all that oxidative stress that causes breathing air, oxygen, sorry, at that depth. So during the whole treatment, you will be there with an inside attendant, who is a DMT, a dive medical technician. So this technician is going to be assessing your evolution, he's going to be assessing the evolution of symptoms, and he's going to be performing a neurological examination to see how you're going. And that again might give us an idea on how you're progressing and if any changes need to be made. So you're going to continue at 60 feet for two more periods of oxygen and air. Eventually at this point in time, depending on how the patient is evolving, the doctor may want to extend the treatment table for up to two more periods at 60 feet and two more periods at 30 feet, making it a really long treatment table. That usually happens with treatments that are where the patient is reluctant to, to or the, the symptoms are reluctant to resolve. But hopefully you will need an extension and you go from 60 feet to 30 feet in about 30 minutes, okay? So at this point in time, things get even more boring because you, ha you have to breathe oxygen for another 15 minutes and then a whole hour of oxygen and then air for 15 and then 30 minutes into the second period, we are about to get ready to surface. Hopefully everything is going fine and during the whole treatment, they were giving you hydration and monitoring the, the progression, but the tender, like Francois was saying, has been breathing air the whole time. So if we don't do something for the tender, the tender is going to get the compression sickness by just being in the chamber. So at this point in time, the tender starts breathing oxygen with you for another 30 minutes, and then both of you come on oxygen back to surface. That usually takes about five hours, four hours and 45 minutes. It's long, it's boring, it's really effective, and hopefully you don't need to go through it. But if you do, now you know what to expect. There are other treatment tables. These are the most common ones used in this part of the world. Table 5, a table 9, a table 6A, which is very aggressive. This is something that is out there. Very few people use it, not because they're afraid, but because it doesn't seem to be that necessary, at least not with the cases we usually, we usually have these days. And you have really long, tab uh, long tables like the one you see down there, which is about 18 hours or 12 hours, and a really short one for those chambers like the monoplace units where the diver cannot make the air break. So they have developed these shorter treatment tables and they seem to be very effective in my the moderate cases. So, but, so once you're at the chamber, what else, what else is going on there? We talked about pressure, we can wrap our mind around that. We talk about how you can off-gas by breathing oxygen. But let me tell you, it's not just about the bubble, okay? We always say that the bubble is just like a bullet. It's not the bullet that kills you, it's what the bullet does to your body, okay? So it's not the bubble what kills you. The bubble is transient. The bubble is going to be there for a short time, but the bubble will do some damage and we need to manage and mitigate and modulate that inflammatory process caused by the bubble. So we don't just squeeze bubbles. There are many more complicated processes going on in the chamber. And just to, to, to mention a few, so we remember that pressure reduces the size of the bubble, but it doesn't dissolve them. It takes much more than just pressure to dissolve a bubble. We know that breathing 100% O2 washes nitrogen out then effectively dissolving them so we got rid of the nitrogen in, in our system but we still have the injury and we need to do something for it. So oxygen itself is a drug but hyperbaric oxygen that is oxygen under pressure at 1.8 or 2.8 absolute that is a different drug. It does things that we cannot do with just putting a, a mask on somebody's face and breathing oxygen. So again hyperbaric oxygen is a different drug than just oxygen, and it provides many other benefits that you can't get anywhere else or any, any other way. So what it does is, well, of course, it reverts tissue hypoxia, maximizing survival of tissue, but it also reduces edema or swelling, and it also modulates the inflammatory response, the reperfusion injury, and the endothelial damage, so the damage to the inside of your blood vessels. 
and it also helps with wound healing and tissue remodelation. It promotes blood vessel regeneration and so on. So many things happen in the chamber that go way beyond what, uh, uh, what one can figure out by just knowing physics and diving and, and, and how to get rid of this. And this is why, this is what ultimately gave birth to what we now know as hyperbaric oxygen therapy, right? There were many things that we could not explain and they started to do research into what these phenomena were and now we know and chambers are used all over the world primarily not for divers but for other purposes. So that is essentially what we had to show you today and what we wanted to convey to you. I think now Brian we, we open to questions, what do you say? Right, um, thanks everybody for being here this evening. Uh, special thanks to all DAN members without whom we could not do this sort of educational outreach. So if you have already posed a question in the chat, I'll be getting on that. But if you haven't, now is a great time to do so. So post your questions in the chat. Um, looking at the chat just now, I do see uh, some folks from Mantis Divers in Costa Rica. It looks like they listed it. So we really appreciate that. And we really appreciate you driving some folks our way. Um, also see someone, uh, Alan in Tulum, is hoping his students are watching. So uh, we hope they are too, Alan. And uh, welcome to all of Alan's students. All right, um, to the questions. Uh, smoking in a hyperbaric chamber, good idea, bad idea, great way to pass the time? <laughs> but there, there are two parts to that question, Brian. Okay. The first part is clearly smoking, which is a great source of heat. It's something actually already burning, add a bit of oxygen. And it's not just a case that the cigarette will burn up a lot quicker, but we could end up with a catastrophic fire in the chamber. That's the safety side in terms of fire. But there is a medical side to smoking inside the chamber. Let me give that to my esteemed colleague here to answer what happens when you're smoking and you're trying to get oxygen into the system to try and um, heal them in the process. Well, I mean, smoking and nicotine is, is never good for wound healing. It causes vasoconstriction. So smoking is, is bad. But yeah, don't smoke in the chamber, please. You also <laughs> have the carbon monoxide that, you know. Well, carbon of, monoxide, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the other, yeah, yeah. The the small amounts of carbon monoxide you're breathing at sea level, they have a far more complicated process when you're breathing them under pressure. It bo bonds with hemoglobin much, in a much stronger way. That's, that's what you mean, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Don't smoke in the chamber, please. Don't smoke in the chamber. Got it. Uh, they won't allow you anyway. <laughs> are monoplace chambers, uh, what, are, what are they made of? Are they um, clear? Can you see through them? And what is that material? Is it plastic, glass, what? So, a good question. So, a monoplace chamber really means a place for one person. And they are, I would say, three different types of materials that you can expect. You could have steel with a few round portals, and that was typically what we had in the beginning, so very limited um, visibility between the, the person on the inside, pretty claustrophobic. Then we have these fiber collapsible portable chambers that have portals, windows on the ends only. So we can't see inside there to see how the dive is doing, but it's effective and you can carry it to the dive site. So there are you know good reasons why you might want to have one of those on, on hand. But if I use the word monoplace chamber, Brian, usually it means an acrylic tube, it's a very special type of plastic that can handle the pressure. Um, and then two metal ends where the door is going to be. And that gives great visibility to the diver on the inside so the doctor can, can visually see just as, just as easily as the tender can on the inside. Clearly they can't get their hands through there, but it's, it's used for millions of treatments every, every year. And as uh, Dr. Nocetto said, it's just that length of time that you need to be in there for that becomes somewhat of a restriction. But it's great for the diver. They get a feeling of people moving around on the outside. They can watch their movies in relative peace or they can sleep really depending on the treatment. But yes, it's called a acrylic. It has a long chemical name, which I won't bore you with now, but very specially designed and manufactured to actually withstand the pressure. It has the same kind of strength properties as a bowling ball. So when you go 10 pin bowling and you throw that ball along, it's kind of got the same impact resistant and tensile properties as a you know fairly robust piece of equipment. So. Yeah, what I'd like to add there is um, monoplace chambers are very popular in the US for the reasons we were talking about before with wound healing. Uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe 80% of the chambers in this country are probably monoplace. 80% of the hyperbaric facilities use monoplace chambers and sometimes they have most likely no less than two and up to four or five uh, chambers at a time. And for some reason, uh, 
sometimes there is a misconception that you cannot treat someone in a, in a monoplace unit, and that is false. Uh, most chambers in this country, they're built in a way that they have the technical capacity to provide a treatment table 6. Uh, you need to make a very small modification, which is uh, putting a, 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 a air brake an air brake mask, uh, and sometimes you don't even need this. Uh, like we said before, in the vast majority of cases of the bends, the diver is not going to die, the diver is fine, he has just some mild symptoms, and those cases Yes, you don't have access to the patient, but if you plan things well, you don't need to have access to the patient because the patient is fine. And you can treat them just fine in a monoplace unit. If you have the capability to do air brakes, great. And if you don't, there are some treatment tables, like I showed before, that have shown that they are very effective in treating someone in a monoplace unit. So the, the main limitation that monoplace units have is not technical, it's usually operational. Is the team not feeling comfortable in doing so in 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 a in a chamber where you don't have access to it? Mm -hmm. But correct me if I'm wrong, um, Matthias. That's part of what we can do here. At Absolutely, Dan. yes. That is part of what we do is try to convince these units that yes, they can do it. We manage to do so on many instances, mm -hmm. and you know when a diver shows up in a chamber, we don't encourage people to do so because that is not the way. But in some instances where the diver showed up there, they, the, the team, the chamber team is, I wouldn't say reluctant, but at least uncomfortable. And we talk with them and we explain to them and they say, oh yeah, I can do this. And we literally, uh, figuratively hold hands with them during the treatment and things go well. Great. Uh, while we're on the subject of monoplace and multiplace, uh, forgive me if you covered this, but oxygen delivery versus the air brakes in each of those, how are those achieved in the two? So in a, in a multiplace chamber, we would be giving the oxygen via a hood in terms of most of the medical clinical chambers we get, they'll have a hood, which is much easier to deliver a higher dose of oxygen to the patient. And a neck seal. With a neck seal. Yeah. And then when they need the air brake, they can either take the, the hood off or they can just change the gas gangs. But right. generally, they take the hood off because it's not that comfortable for the patient. Traditionally, we have a mask. Mm -hmm. So the patient will have the mask on, and when the air brake comes on, they say masks off. They take the mask I off, see. and it's, again, so less claustrophobic. the environment in that multi-place chamber is all is that they air. need. Yep. Yeah. In the monoplace chamber, we get two different ways monoplace chambers are run. In the US, it tends to be 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. So as Matthias says, we then they normally take a mask in there with them, mm -hmm. and the, the, the operator will say, listen, mask on, they'll put the mask on their face, they'll hold it there for five minutes, depending on what treatment they've been given, mm -hmm. and they'll be dre breathing basically air. The chamber environment remains oxygen, and they, they're breathing So in air. the larger chamber, you've got ambient air, Correct. and oxygen via mask or yes. hood, and in the opposite. In a and the thing with a mask in a multi-place chamber is you can change the gas. You can give them air, or if you find that for whatever reason you set up for this, you want to go just that little bit further in terms of depth mm -hmm. to 100 feet of seawater, you can put a mixture into the mask, a 50-50 mm -hmm. heliox or nitrox mix. So there's a lot of flexibility, and sure. that's why we like the multi-place chambers. Just, Brian, I, I said there are two types of monoplace kind mm -hmm. of applications. In some of the countries, say oxygen is really expensive because mm -hmm. these monoplace chambers use you know, 250 to 400 liters a minute. You can dive it back, but really with a diver, you want to keep that oxygen level up. Mm -hmm. They actually dive the chamber on air. They have an air compressor, they dive the chamber on medical air, mm -hmm. and then the patient, instead of having an air brake on a mask, is having his oxygen or her oxygen mm -hmm. through the mask, and when the air brake comes, they take the mask off. So, you know, sure. we kind of get different variations. Cool. In a similar um, way, you use a multiplace. Sure. You breathe the treatment gas through a mask and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, a couple other great questions here in the chat. Um, what is the reason that we are limited by partial pressure of oxygen while we dive, but not so much while we're in a chamber? That's a very common question. So, yeah. So, we know that while we're diving, uh, using nitrox, for instance, uh, the maximum partial pressure of oxygen that we are comfortable with in the water is 1.4. And we were just talking about in a chamber that you're breathing up to 2.8 atmospheres of oxygen, at least on the treatment table 6 in the U.S. Navy. So why, why that? Why can't we breathe 2.8 underwater? Well, your physiology is not the same when you're sitting on a chair on a bench in, 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 in the chamber than when you're underwater. One of the, the first things that happens when you're underwater, besides all the fluid redistribution with 
vasoconstriction and, and, and this urge to pee that this causes is you're always losing temperature, right? Water, as warm as it might be, it's never as warm as your body. So you will be releasing temperature to, to the water. So in, in, in a way to try to prevent heat loss, your body will start to burn energy, right? To keep up with that temperature loss. With the burning of the energy comes, you're burning sugar essentially. And by burning sugar, you, you're creating a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So your basal metabolism is elevated when you're in the water. So CO2 is a, CO2 is a, a, a vasodilator, okay? So it, it makes your blood vessels go larger. Oxygen is a vasoconstrictor. It makes your blood vessels to, to shrink. So when, when the only way or what the main, most effective way our brain has to prevent us from having oxygen toxicity is by shutting down the faucet, by causing vasoconstriction in your brain to prevent this excessive oxygen concentration. But if I have a high concentration of CO2, I have a, a stimuli that says do the exact opposite. So, well, your brain and nature is wise. If I cause excessive vasoconstriction, I may cause infarction and eventually have permanent brain damage. If I cause vasodilation when I have too much oxygen, I may cease. Well, I'd rather cease than die. So when you have a high concentration of CO2 and a high concentration of oxygen, that is bad for your oxygen toxicity threshold. Okay, so it, it lowers your oxygen toxicity threshold. So we don't want anybody to be breathing any more than 1.4 underwater. And because in a chamber, your basal metabolism is much lower and your CO2 is much lower, we can afford a higher concentration of oxygen in a chamber. Great. Okay, so we've got a ton of questions. So let's uh, fire through these. Um, how does the chamber continue to run if the power goes out and the compressors stop working? So the first part of that answer, Brian, is planning. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we try to do here at Dan is to try and you know, help chambers understand some of these safety issues. So. It should be designed to handle a power outage and typically what happens in an island where power is a big problem is they will have a high pressure compressor so they will pump up their storage banks, their big cylinders up to high pressure and when they run the treatment they'll be using high pressure air to run the treatment mm -hmm. not air coming from the low pressure compressor. So that would be one way to continue the treatment. Really important for a diver if your diver is being treated with an embolism or some form of bubble blockage that's significant you don't want to abort the treatment. If it's a routine HPO, medical wound healing treatment, you can stop the treatment and then continue the next day. The other way is to have a generator, an electrical generator that can keep the, the low pressure compressor running. But it's, it's really such a critical part of the planning and when we are out there visiting these chambers, you know, it's a question that comes up, what should we do? And, and we try to address that to say, when you abort a dive with an injured diver in the chamber, it can be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. You need to continue that treatment. And the, yeah. the clear answer when you, on an island where power happens to be a, a limitation, would be to store the, the gas before the time, and then you can see the treatment through. They just have to do the calculations correct, they have enough gas. You know, because if you, if you start a 90-minute treatment and it turns out into four and a half hours, you need a heck of a lot more gas than you do for, for 90 minutes. Sure. All right. Uh, is there always a tender during a Table 6 treatment? There should always be a tender. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, know that in, we know that in some places uh, they haven't had one. Mm -hmm. If you see this, if you know this, try to persuade them to get one and to improve their, their operations because it is a, a very poor practice to put a, a patient in a, in a chamber without a tender. Mm -hmm. How about in a monoplace, what would they typically do? Well, clearly in a monoplace, you cannot put a tender. That's mm -hmm. why the team has to be prepared and they need to foresee what could happen. And some cases, a monoplace is not the best chamber to treat them. Mm -hmm. In which case, well, you just don't treat them. You refer them somewhere else. I see. Part of what we do and why for us communication with those chambers is so important. Mm -hmm. And if I saw we're talking about this today, when, you know, quite often we get someone that wants to, to do good and to improve safety for everybody. And they say, hey, I heard that there's a new chamber in X, Y, or Z island. Mm -hmm. And and so they, they need help and, and they, can, can you help them? So yes, we can help them. 
So try to get them, put them in touch with us and we want to find out what they can do, what type of chamber they have, if they need any help with SOPs, if they need any help with, with their preparedness, with training, we'll be happy to do it. Actually, we do have a chamber operators a, a training course that is not commercially available, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's designed specifically to satisfy this need. And, and so if we don't know what the chamber can do, we cannot make a good referral. Once we know what the chamber can do, we know that this case is something they can handle. And we're going to call them and say, hey, we have this case with A, B, and C characteristics. And they say, yes, mm -hmm. we, we can treat them. And if we know we have a different case that this chamber cannot handle, we're not going to refer them to them just because it's closed. Mm -hmm. We refer patients to the most appropriate facility based on what we know is going on with that case. Great. Um, okay, here's a uh, question. I seem to remember Table 6A being used for treatment of some certain instances such as AGE. Is this still the standard or is Table 6 now more common? So keep in mind that these treatment tables were meant and designed by the U.S. Navy. So it's a different kettle of fish. Uh, the, the, the Navy diver is different than a Joe diver out there. Uh, the, there is no stigma in, 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 in reporting signs and symptoms. Uh, and the chamber availability is right there. And the triple table six was designed specifically for that purpose, for AGE. Now, and Francois can speak better on the technical complexity and the risks of running a treatment that at that pressure but for all practical purposes I think it's quite rarely used and many if not most cases of AGE can and have been treated successfully with the treatment table 6. We of course it's out there it's it's public domain it's it's nothing secret but we don't encourage people to do a treatment table 6 unless the 6A, sorry. Yes, thank you. So we don't encourage people to do treatment of a 6A unless they have all the technical infrastructure to do so, all the training to do so, and the procedures if they get stuck, because mm -hmm. that's the key. Everything goes well until something bad happens. And if something bad happens at 165 and you don't know what to do, you have the patient is your problem, the tender is your problem, mm -hmm. everything can well, go you, south. you could very easily go into saturation and you'll be in there for two or three yeah. days and these chambers are not designed for that length of time. Yeah. And remember, at that depth, you're breathing air, not oxygen. So mm -hmm. all of that healing effect is going to be lost while the patient's... And, and at, the at tender depth. is pretty narked at that depth too. Indeed. So Yeah, yeah. So bottom line is we don't encourage anybody to use a 6A unless they do have the training not the guts, the training to do so. Got it. And the support equipment. Yeah. But remember Matthias's diagram showing the bubble size decrease? The bubble size decrease is not significant enough to warrant exactly. the risk. Sure. People will do it, Navy divers will do it, but in general, if you speak to the, you know, the really um, experienced mm -hmm. dive doctors, they can advise you against doing that unless you really are yep. upset up And also it. there is a history for why the, chim the treatment table 6A looks the way it looks when you see what treatment tables they had before the implementation of 5, 6, and 6A. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, a, that's for a different day. Yep, a quick one for you, and um, maybe this is as much, are you able to versus are you allowed to, can you sleep during treatment? Yes, of course. Yes, <laughs> it's great. Uh, with uh, heat and, and loud noises, it might be complicated, but well, you know, they should, you're certainly welcome they, to. Yeah, the, the heat it should, you should be able to keep the temperature okay. kind of rather than 72. So that would be more just during the compression. If you're in the tropics sometimes and there's no AC, it gets pretty warm inside sure. there. But people tend to get sleepy when it's warm. Mm -hmm. It's great for the healing rate to cool everything, to calm everything down. The great. breathing rate goes down. So yes, many people will actually sleep Good. in the treatment. Now, your treatment, your sleep will be interrupted. Sure. Because they want to see how you're evolving. And many yeah. things are just not what they can see, but how you report your symptoms. So they will ask you, how is the pain going? Mm -hmm. They will need to repeat a neurological examination. So are you going to ha have a great night's sleep? No, but yes, you can sleep. Sure thing. Um, here's a question. Being on a Navy Table 6, the diver is breathing 100% oxygen at 3.0 
partial pressure, um, and I think it's 2.8. It's 2.8 so, yeah. atmospheres. 2.8 yeah. atmospheres, yeah. absolute. Yeah, yeah. absolute. Yeah. And that's uh, 2.8 because it's uh, 60 feet equivalent rather yeah, than... Yeah, there are reasons for mm -hmm. that. So the, the higher you go, the more likely you are to have a seizure. And the only mm -hmm. time you go to 3 ATA is going to be for something radical like a carbon monoxide poisoning where you mm -hmm. really need to get that super saturation of oxygen right but for divers that standard of care is 60 feet okay um, in the commercial industry I think this is a comment you we were speaking earlier about the question of uh, higher partial pressures of oxygen in a chamber versus uh, what we'd see when diving and I think someone has added to that says in the commercial industry we also make sure that the bands on the oxygen mask are not used in case of an oxygen hit it seems like that's a mitigation measure in case someone does experience an oxy oxygen seizure. Yeah, the, the important thing a commercial divers will tell you, you know, that their nightmare is you're inside a chamber and you're mm -hmm. deeper than the limit for oxygen. You grab the mask, you put the mask on at 100 um, feet to see what are you doing, some workup dive, mm -hmm. and you put an O2 mask on. So they have totally separate manifolds providing the gases, so mm -hmm. you don't have a commercial diver getting a, a lung full of oxygen at some excessive well, depth. Also, Very important safety safety issue. Right, the other reason if, if, if you have the, the straps on and the diver starts seizing, the only way to stop him from seizing is to remove the mask. Mm -hmm. So if he falls unconscious and he's still breathing oxygen, he's going to continue seizing. So that's right. why you don't put the mask. When you're breathing, it needs to be, you need to be making the effort of a breathing oxygen. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what needs to be held and not mm -hmm. strapped. Mm -hmm. How do they make sure the electronics in the chamber are not a hazard? It's easy. You don't have electronics <laughs> in the chamber. All right. <laughs> no, I, 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 somewhat of a, of a jesting comment. No, mm -hmm. with, with, the ad, with the advent of new things like continuous glucose monitoring, we do have electronic devices that can go in the chamber. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we keep the power right down, we keep the voltage right down, we make sure that if there are batteries in there that they're properly encapsulated, mm -hmm. it can handle the pressure. It works just fine. I mean, right. we know people take tablets and things inside the chamber, which they shouldn't do because of the fire risk, but they work just fine. And you mentioned something about sometimes people can watch a movie, each might have their own screen. Is that going to be outside of the... No, so that, that's really the point I'm speaking to, yeah. a, low, a low power LED monitor that's mm -hmm. been properly designed, you know, right. modified, I should say, okay. with vent holes and so on. And they make sure they monitor the heat inside there. There's no heat buildup, but okay. yes, they work just Correct. fine. And in some cases, you actually flush nitrogen through the electronics yeah. sure. to prevent Keep it from. It, keep it cool. Yeah. That's okay, right. uh, we mentioned some solutes to avoid uh, before and after diving. Are there others? No, no, that was okay. just a silly <laughs> joke in terms of the physics of just putting Mentos in, in, in a soda, <laughs> but no. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, uh, solutes are not part of a uh, treatment for the compression sickness. Good, okay. Can you comment on the proliferation of soft chambers and claims to have maximum pressure of one and a half I was, ATA? I was hoping that question <laughs> wouldn't come up, okay. but it's actually relatively, I won't get into the politics, this is a very sensitive issue because I've got another one for you these then. soft chambers are not essentially medical devices, I know some folks will argue with us. The pressure is too low, Brian. Okay. We need to get them to 2.8 ATA and in the soft chamber, it's going to be lower than what some people believe is the limit for a pressure vessel and mm -hmm. I would... I would say I think I'm going to be hammered by some of the people out there. I'd rather that patient was in a stretch in a hospital mm. than they were locked up in a bag where I can't see them and something goes wrong and I only pick it up much later and the, and the healing effect is okay. is not sufficient. Am yeah. I about yeah. right, Matisse? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you need uh, in excess of 1.4, 1.5 to have any uh, uh, hyperbaric oxygen benefit. Remember what I said before, oxygen is a drug, hyperbaric oxygen is a different drug. Mm -hmm. With this... Uh, uh, humble chambers, you barely reach that uh, that uh, level of of uh, uh, FiO two. So it's it's no. It, it, they they want to portray them as hyperbaric oxygen, and mm. no, that is that is a stretch. It's, it's a sensitive issue. We are well aware of that, and some people have taken us to task. But no, that is not the correct um, sure. piece of equipment to All treat. All right, more controversial ones for you. We still saw many divers going to a chamber uh, to have a bubble washout, um, and many chamber facilities in certain parts of the world may offer that bubble washout service to divers. Do you care to comment Matthias, on that? I'm going to give that to you. Yeah, there, there is a word for that. That is it starts um, with the B, right? Uh, with R, rubbish. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yes, no, you don't need a washout treatment. Uh, there may be um, other reasons, maybe commercial reasons to put you in a chamber, but there's, there's no science behind 
giving preventive treatments or washer treatments to prevent what? I mean, we know that every 12 hours, every 24 hours, if you will, you get rid of everything you had, everything you did on that dive is history. You don't get uh, residual nitrogen bubbles or silent bubbles that are going to cause you more uh, problems because you dive more often. No, no. If anybody is, is trying to convince you that you need that, uh, please get in touch with us. We can give you uh, good articles to read and to debunk that myth. Uh, again, that is not medicine. It's not based in science. There are commercial interests, but not scientific uh, ones. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matthias. You're actually just adding more burden to the system again. You're putting more nitrogen back into the blood. Yeah. Uh, in what circumstances would DCS not be treated by hyperbaric oxygen? Okay, so when do you not treat? If we know the diver has the compression sickness, uh, we do want to treat. There may be instances in which uh, not treating in a chamber is acceptable because the cost, risk, benefit is just not there. Some very mild cases, very select cases where there's absolutely no neurological involvement and when the symptoms are deemed and considered mild by a specialist, when recompression is not available because it would take many hours counting them in, in days to reach a chamber it's just not worth it and although initially we were not very comfortable with that when i say we is not dan but the diving medical community although we were not comfortable with that experience has proven that the result is very very good anyway uh, th there is no association with any worse outcomes and, and these divers don't have any sequelae of any kind. So, but again, it's not that we can treat or not treat. Uh, when it's not possible, well, we just don't treat with the chamber. However, we do provide hydration. We do provide oxygen, uh, normal baric oxygen, and we do neurological evaluations to make sure that we are where we thought we were. But it's not an option. When we can, we always treat. Okay. Great, I think this is our last question. Oh, maybe a couple more. Um, let's see, in in-water recompression, maybe that's beyond the scope of that's, this. That's for, that's for a whole yes. two lecture. Yeah. yeah, okay, so that'll be a hyperbaric treatment with no chamber. Maybe we'll uh, have to yeah. do another yeah. session. That's gonna on be that. an interesting one. All right, um, let's see what else we've got. Um, Yes, and this person mentions uh, soft chambers being more useful for high altitude pulmonary edema. And that's indeed, right. That's that actually is true. under the FDA here in uh -huh. the US. That's what they are actually. That's the permission they get to market the chambers under a gamma off bag, a yes. high altitude uh, right. treatment. Yeah. Uh, great. Device. And it looks like one more would breathing surface oxygen after a dive as a general process serve as a preventative measure. So. Well, breathing oxygen after a dive, we know that it would help you off gas, but it's not a standard diving procedure. So should you do it? It doesn't seem to be necessary. Now, would it have a benefit in you off gassing faster? Yeah, absolutely. But, but again, it's not a standard procedure. You need to keep in mind that if you're going to be using oxygen to, just to help you off gas, then you don't necessarily know where you are after that dive in terms of what should I, what could I do next uh, in terms of repetitive dives. And also you might be consuming oxygen that might be necessary for somebody else if that someone has an injury. So it is not something we recommend, but from a biological, physical point of view, would it help you off gas faster? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I believe uh, that is all the time we have this evening. But once again, thanks to so many people who tuned in with us uh, right here in Durham, North Carolina from Duke University, uh, right in Columbia, South Carolina. Sounds like a contingent there was watching. Uh, folks posting the link in uh, Queensland University Divers Facebook page. Thank you for that. Um, our own Dan teams in Indonesia and Argentina were joining us. Thanks to you all for being there. And once again, thanks to all the Dan members who allow this sort of educational outreach. We could not do it without you. We hope you have a great evening. Good night. Thank you.